History Hatters. Located in the northwest quadrant of the DuPont Circle neighborhood of Washington, D.C., just a stone's throw from the Phillips Collection stands the Anderson House, a Gilded Age mansion which, unbeknownst to most, is a portal to the American Revolution. In May of 1783, the last year of the American Revolutionary War, officers of the Continental Army encamped at New Bird, New York, founded the Society of the Cincinnati as a fraternal organization for Revolutionary War veteran officers. The society drew its name from the ancient Roman leader Lucius Quintius Cincinnatus, who was well recognized for both his civic duty and his willingness to quickly step down from serving as a ruling dictator immediately once threats to the Roman Republic abated. According to historian Gordon S. Wood, early Americans perceived their victory over Great Britain as a return to antique virtues. One such virtue was that of the gentleman farmer, who took up arms during times of war, but was eager to return to his plow and live a life of independence. None was more aware of this virtuous image of a Roman gentleman farmer than the commander-in-chief of the Continental Army, General George Washington, who agreed to serve as the society's first president, and then later, in December of 1783, resigned his commission and returned to his farm at Mount Vernon in Virginia. Despite America's victory in the war, Wood reminds us that shortly after the Revolution, inequality in the former British colonies was greater than before. Perhaps there's some irony that the legendary Cincinnatus was victorious over plebeians and the poor of Rome, who demanded greater rights and protections against the rule of the wealthy Romans. The society formed in his name in early America elected to make membership limited to veteran officers, meaning those who enlisted or served as part of a militia were ineligible to join. However, membership could be passed on to a society member's male heir. The society soon became a target for those eager to lampoon the young nation's stagnant inequality, decried by Samuel Adams as a rapid stride towards a hereditary military nobility as was ever made in so short a time. In a letter to his daughter, Benjamin Franklin wrote, I should not myself, if my advice had been asked, have objected to their wearing their riband and badge themselves according to their fancy. Though I certainly should, to the entailing it as an honor on their posterity. For honor worthily obtained, as that, for example, of our officers, is in its nature a personal thing, and incommunicable to any but those who had some share in obtaining it. To distinguish society members as men of honor, Pierre L'Enfant, a Continental Army engineer and later architect of our nation's capital, designed an eagle lapel badge to be worn by its members. At the first general meeting of the society, George Washington proposed eliminating hereditary membership. The society agreed to do so if the constituent societies would later ratify this change. Ultimately, at the time of Washington's death in 1799, hereditary inheritance remained part of the institution, and Alexander Hamilton succeeded Washington as the society's new leader. For many decades, the society flourished, but by 1854, membership dwindled with the passing of the last surviving Revolutionary War officers. As a result, the society broadened its membership criteria to include male descendants of Continental officers who were once eligible to join the society but had not done so in their lifetimes. So how did the society's headquarters end up in the DuPont Circle neighborhood of Washington, D.C.? In 1938, author and philanthropist Isabel Anderson gifted one of her lavish homes to serve as the society's headquarters in honor of her late husband, Lars Anderson III, who was both an active member and the great-grandson of one of the society's original charter members, Continental Army Captain Richard C. Anderson. Before the Battle of Trenton, New Jersey, Captain Anderson crossed the Delaware River in the same boat as George Washington. Captain Anderson's son, Lars I, later settled in Cincinnati and served as director of the Citizens National Bank. It is remarkable that the very name Cincinnati traces back directly to the Society of the Cincinnati. Continental Army General Arthur St. Clair, who later became governor of the Northwest Territory, is rumored to have passed by the newly established town of Los Santiville in 1790 and remarked, What an awful name, damn it! Call it Cincinnati! It was in Cincinnati where Lars hosted his brother Robert, who organized Union troops at nearby Camp Denison. 
Robert notably achieved the rank of Brigadier General after leading the defense at Fort Sumter in Charleston, South Carolina during the First Battle of the Civil War. Several of Lars's sons fought for the Union Army during the Civil War, including Brevet Brigadier General Nicholas Anderson, who later joined the Society of the Cincinnati, taking the seat of his grandfather, Revolutionary War veteran Captain Richard Anderson. General Nicholas Anderson would eventually pass his seat onto his son, Lars Anderson III. Lars III was a Harvard alumnus who, after dropping out of Harvard Law School, relied on his father's help to secure a diplomatic position in London to serve under General Anderson's friend and classmate, Robert Todd Lincoln, President Lincoln's son and U.S. Minister to the Court of St. James's. Lars made a career in the American diplomatic corps, serving later in Italy as a U.S. Minister in Belgium and very briefly as a U.S. Ambassador in Japan. It was during Lars' service in Rome in 1896 when he met his future wife, Isabel Weld Perkins. Both Isabel and Lars were raised in high society. Isabel inherited several million dollars at the age of five from her family's shipping empire, the Black Horse Line. She descended from numerous veterans of the American Revolution and proudly represented them in the Daughters of the American Revolution and the National Society of the Colonial Dames of America. The two married in 1897 in Massachusetts, and the following year, Lars volunteered to serve as an army captain during the Spanish-American War. He was stationed at Camp Alger in Virginia and served only a few months. It was around this time he took his father's place as a member of the Society of the Cincinnati. In 1901, mere months after Isabel gained complete control of her inheritance, the pair began making plans to acquire an additional home in the nation's capital. Lars's family moved to Washington during his teenage years, and his mother offered them her home at 16th and K Street, designed by the renowned architectural firm Hornblower & Marshall. However, the pair sought something new and unique to suit their own tastes. As a result, Boston architects Arthur Little and Herbert Brown designed an elaborate Beau Arts mansion along Massachusetts Avenue to serve as a private residence and show place for Isabel and Lars Anderson. Perhaps the best way we should explore the Anderson house is to imagine we are guests, arriving during Washington's vibrant winter social scene which ran from December through May. In 1909, the Andersons entertained over 2,000 visitors in a single winter season. Tonight our invitation is for dinner at 8. We are expected to be prompt, so at 7.50 servants assist us from our carriages as we arrive in the forecourt. Immediately upon entering, we notice Asian art, denoting our host's worldly adventures. As we pass through the choir room, lined with carved walnut choir stalls from Renaissance Italy, we see emblems above the stalls painted by noted muralist H. Siddons Mowbray. These represent Lars Anderson's vision that I have always felt that in America we had no right to coats of arms, but did to emblems of patriotic orders. We take note of the Society of the Cincinnati and the Daughters of the American Revolution emblems as we cross into the Grand Staircase Hall. Maids and footmen remove our coats and hats and we could pause briefly in the gentlemen's or ladies' lounges here before ascending the Grand Staircase. On our ascent, it feels a bit as though we just joined an inaugural procession of a Venetian doge, a monumental work of art by Spanish painter Jose Villegas. Entering the Cincinnati room, more murals by Mowbray intertwine the Anderson's family history with the founding of the Republic, the Society of the Cincinnati, and their family's participation to preserve the Union during the Civil War. It's here we are greeted by our hosts, Lars and Isabel Anderson. We then enter either of the drawing rooms, one in French style and the other in English. After a few cocktails, around nine, the butler would pair gentlemen and ladies together in accordance with the custom dinner chart created by the Andersons. From there, a chosen pair would venture down the long gallery, which contained many artifacts from abroad, some of which remain today. As we enter the dining room, we notice 16th century Flemish tapestries, four of which depict the ancient Grecian mythology of Diana, the Virgin Huntress. These tapestries even accompanied the Andersons to Brussels in 1911 when Lars served as U.S. Minister. After dinner, we descend a floating staircase into the saloon. Tonight, we are joined by dozens of additional guests who failed to score a dinner invitation, but appeared for tonight's musical festivities nonetheless. 
Men often congregated in the billiard room for cigars and brandy, while ladies enjoyed the winter garden, which was stuffed full of all manner of plants and free-flying parrots. In several ways, the house was already a memorial to the Society of the Cincinnati, as Lars described in his journal shortly before his death. I felt that Anderson House might be an especially suitable place for a gathering of the Cincinnati, because so many features commemorating the society had been introduced into the architecture. The eagle appears in the pediment over the main portico entrance. It also appears in the fresco above the fireplace of the hall at the foot of the grand staircase and in the ceiling of the saloon. Perhaps now is a good time to juxtapose the Andersons' affinity to their family's respective roles in the American Revolution against Samuel Adams' warning against the establishment of the Society of the Cincinnati as it would cement a hereditary military nobility. Indeed, the Andersons boldly celebrated the achievements of their ancestors as though the American Revolution was an honor they shared a part in obtaining. However, Benjamin Franklin's critique rings true that such honor, worthily obtained, is in its nature a personal thing, and incommunicable to any but those who had some share in obtaining it. In many ways, the inequality felt by those following the American Revolution mirrored the inequality of the Gilded Age that surrounded the erection of the Anderson House. Except I would wager during the turn of the 20th century, an even greater share of the working class owned even less of America, and the extravagance enjoyed by very few was unparalleled in American history. After all, how many people in the 1930s could afford to turn their spare home into a museum? Undoubtedly, the most unexpected result of the Society of Cincinnati's decision to permit membership by means of hereditary inheritance occurred in 1952, when the second term Prime Minister of Great Britain, Sir Winston Churchill, joined the society and received his eagle insignia in the saloon. Churchill's eligibility derived from his American mother's family, the Jeromes, who fought against the crown in the American Revolutionary War. Churchill used this occasion to proclaim, I value this honor and let it be a help to all old forces. They are, in my opinion, irresistible forces which draw our two nations together, not for any unworthy purpose of combination or gathering strength, but in order that we may defend the freedom of the world. I would like to thank the Anderson House and its volunteer docents for making this episode of the History Hat possible. Subscribe by clicking on the History Hat logo as we continue to explore the mysteries of history!